Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We begin our new series, Holding On to Truth Today. And this is our series on the importance of a biblical worldview. And uh, I'm really, this is actually more of a teaser. I'm using this Sunday to help you. I encourage you to invite others out next week. I'm gonna define more of what is a biblical worldview and what we're seeing in our world today. Uh, and what I'm gonna do today though, is I wanna talk about why we need to hold on to truth and why we need to have a biblical worldview. And uh, so that's the why behind this series. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a lot of movements going on right now where we try to mix the world's views with scripture and try to reconcile them. And, and we say that, oh, I guess we can do this and this. And it's, it's not true. Um, there's a lot of misinterpretation of scripture to help people live um, however they want to live. Uh, there is the deconstructing movement where we deconstruct our faith and now begin to question the Bible, but un unfortunately we question it to the point of distorting the scriptures. Are anyone aware of the deconstructing movement that's going on in our society? Just so you know, it's heavily moving and it's uh, heavily on social media and it's moving rapidly in our social media networks, especially our young generations. And so these are important things that we want you to be aware of. Our, part of our next gen vision and disciple making vision here at Calvary is we need to know what is truth so we can actually pass it down to the next generation. Otherwise we're passing down something else we shouldn't pass down. Meanwhile, the next generation's coming to us going, you don't, that's not, that's not how you're supposed to think or live or believe. That's, that's a lie, the Bible's a lie the young generation will say. Are you guys aware of this? This is what's happening in our culture and it's not just happening outside the church, it's now happening inside the church. Entire denominations are splitting over arguments that were clear in scripture a few decades ago and now they're not. So we at Calvary wanna make sure we polish up on what is a biblical worldview what is truth and why we hold on to scriptures and hold on to the Bible. This is the truth and we will hold on to the truth here at Calvary. We also want you to be equipped to know how to lovingly speak the truth to people in your community or even in your own home that need to be reminded what is true and what is not. I think we would all agree that we appreciate truth more than we appreciate lies. Sounds like I'm right. I think we've all appreciated the truth instead of lies or even liars in our life. Truth is the moral virtue of honesty and purity from falsehood. So it's to be pure and have no falsehood in it. That's what truth is. That's the moral attribute. But truth is also an objectional fact, a certainty, a definite or what I call something absolute that you cannot remove or make imperfect, but is absolutely true. What do you do though, when you live in a world that denies, ignores, waters down, or erases absolute truth or tries to, and this truth guides and defines how we ought to think and live. What do we do when the world's doing that? Or when the world claims the truth is wrong and whatever you want to be true is right. It's a little tricky, so hang, in, hang on today because I'm going to try to answer some of these questions. What we need to do is find out what is the truth and then hold on to it with our dear lives. Or the option is to be in this world that's confused and lost in a bunch of ideas of what truth is and then everyone's following a lie and then falling into a pit, being led by the blind into a pit, as scripture would say. To not follow the spiritual blind, the, those who don't understand the truth and you fall into that pit. So what is truth? Let's talk about truth on trial today. Truth is on trial 
in our society. We're going to turn to John chapter 18, and we're going to be in verse 28. John chapter 18. We're going to look at the trial of Jesus before Pilate, just a, just a piece of it, and see what he said about this topic. This is before Jesus went to the cross. Verse 28 says, Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them. And he's talking about the Jewish leaders. They didn't believe that they should be around Gentiles. And they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover if they went in with him. So they didn't go in with him because they wanted to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Uh, in John chapter 12, 32 and 33, he says that if I will be lifted up, then I can draw all men to myself. He's referring to the Romans' invention of crucifixion. The, Rome, the Roman world invented crucifixion, and so he had said that he would be lifted up, meaning he would be crucified on a cross. Verse 33, then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your question or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king? And Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. And then he went out again to the people and told them, he is not guilty of any crime. Take note of that. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Barabbas was a murderer. And they chose Barabbas over Jesus. Truth on trial. What I love about what Jesus says here is he says, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth, all who love the truth recognize what I say is true. What we have here is, is Jesus is saying, I, God or I have descended, God has descended down to earth in Christ to give us the truth. And Jesus was sinless, good, and just, making him the perfect witness to take the stand and testify to the truth. And here we have the Roman governor, Pilate, who even says, you're guilty of no sin or no crime. You're guilty of no crime. And so he's wanting him to, to set him free, but he skirts the responsibility and puts it back in the Jews to replace. It doesn't appear that Pilate wanted to wait for an answer because he said, what is the truth? And then immediately pro progressed to do what he wanted to do. And he didn't recognize at the time that truth was standing right in front of him. Because truth isn't just an idea, it's embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're taking notes, that's an important note. Truth isn't just an idea, it's embodied in the person, in the life, in the deity, the divine life of Jesus Christ. That is truth. Here's what Christianity believes. If you're new to the Christian faith, you're gonna learn some theology through this journey of our series. And we as a church are gonna be reminded of what we believe as Christians. Uh, number one, we believe Jesus is truth and God is truth. And we believe that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one in what we call the Godhead. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or it's God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we also call the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the view of it is all there. The three persons are there. And so it's the triune God. And so we as biblical scholars have taken the word Trinity to represent the three uh, God in three persons, but still one God. And so when Jesus uh, says he is truth here in this scripture, we're going to see also that he says God is truth. John 14, 6 through 9 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Philip was one of his disciples, his followers. Jesus replied, have I, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? I'm going to read a couple more verses. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Because Jesus did signs and wonders, and they began to say, man, he, he really is the Son of God. And he's reminding them, believe because of the things I've done too, I've been verifying that who I am, that I have come from God. And when you've seen me, you have seen God. So right away, when we say Jesus is truth, we can imply as well that God is truth, amen? I know that seems elementary for us, but we need to make sure I clarify this for all those who are gonna watch this one day or watch online right now. We've invited a lot of people to watch and be a part of the series. Um, secondly, the Holy Spirit is truth. Of course, we already know that because he's part of the Trinity, part of the fellowship of God. But John 16, 13 says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, if Jesus is truth, that means the Holy Spirit will guide you into Jesus. And it also says in scripture that the Holy Spirit came to testify of the truth, to testify about Jesus. And he does that for us. He comes in and he lives in our lives and he testifies to the truth who is Jesus. Uh, it says the rest of the verse, he will not speak on his own, but he would tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. What has he heard? The spirit says what God wants the spirit to say in other places in scripture. Thirdly, the word or the Bible is truth. Now, this is Jesus saying this. He says these words, and by the way, Jesus said John 16, 13. Now Jesus says this in John 17, 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So Christianity believes that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, and the word, the scriptures, is truth. The Christian reasons, now I want you to, take this amazing quote from Morris Inch, who wrote the book, A Case for Christianity. It's such a powerful quote. The Christian reasons that if humans are made in the image of God, so your image bearers made in his likeness, to seek for truth apart from God's guidance, apart from your creator, is to admit failure from the outset. Without reliance on God's revelation, we cannot hope to fit into its proper life, fit life into its proper framework. That's, that's a really important conclusion because what we talked about a couple weeks ago is when I was appealing to unbelievers is that you were created by God. So to find out your true identity is to find out who your creator is and what he says about you and what his plans were for you. Were for you. Well, we also depend on God's revelation to know who we are and to know what truth is. So Christians believe God revealed that he is truth through Jesus, the word, and the Holy Spirit. God and his word, we believe as Christians, <clears throat> is absolute truth. That you can't change God, you can't say he's a liar. Even Hebrews 6 says that God does not lie, implying that he is truth. 
So this means that if God's word, if God himself, if Jesus and the Holy Spirit all together are truth and absolute truth, this means the truth is the measuring rod, standard and guide to help us know what is true and what is false. Now truth <clears throat> has been on trial for ages. Truth has been, uh, I, I'm, personally, I'm personally not surprised by the attacks on Christians' belief of absolute truth. Why? Because it's been attacked since the Garden of Eden. Why don't you turn your Bibles in Genesis chapter three. <clears throat> Genesis chapter three, starting with verse one. I don't have this on the screen today just to <clears throat> help out with the amount of slides I had. But Genesis chapter three, verse one, and by the way, all the notes on our website, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. The serpent, also the devil, was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, which is Eve, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Notice the questioning right there. The questioning of God's authority and word. Did he really say you shouldn't? You know what that did? That casted a, a seed of doubt. <clears throat> of course, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And she says, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. The word God said, that's the same thing that has to do with God's words speaking from his mouth. It's how we have the world. God spoke us into existence. He spoke creation. He speaks, what he speaks creates. And what he speaks is law and commands. And so here he is saying this, you must not eat. Now, if they choose to eat this, that is disobedience. Therefore, sin enters the world, and we know that's what happened. He, this is what the serpent does. This is what the, the serpent is the devil, and it's a very interesting animal to use to represent the devil. <clears throat> you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, it's interesting because the devil was casted down because he wanted to be God. So now he's down on earth encouraging mankind to be God. I don't know if you've ever caught that reading this. It's important to understand. Tempting them to be like God, to think like God. But they can't. None of us can. Just so you know, we can't be God. So the woman was convinced just like that. She saw that the tree was beautiful and it, it was enticing and now you have this tempter by her side and the desire for wisdom and knowledge is there and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You see, truth, God's word, has been questioned and attacked since the beginning of mankind. So we're not surprised. And notice who's the one attacking, the great accuser, the great liar, the one who wanted to be worshiped but won't be worshiped. So you know why the devil attacks you and me? Do you know why the devil attacks truth? because he doesn't want God to be worshiped. He doesn't want you to worship him. The devil doesn't want you to do that. He wants it, but he can't have you and you shouldn't let him. This scripture is very revealing for today's time, but it was written thousands of years ago. It, was, it took place hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 59, 14 through 15. Truth is outlawed. Here's my point. Truth is outlawed and attacked where sin and evil are celebrated. So 
truth will be attacked and outlawed wherever sin is celebrated, wherever evil is celebrated. Of course, if evil and sin, which are the opposite of what God wants, if those things are prominent in a community or culture or a place, then guess what? Truth, is, truth will be unpopular. I call it unpopular truth. And I believe this is mirroring our world today, this scripture. But in the context of Isaiah 59, God was warning the people against sin to his own people. So it would be like God telling us as a church, look out for the sin in your church or in your camp, in your life, especially starting with us individually. Amen? Amen. And so here's what it says, Isaiah 59, 14 through 15. Our courts oppose the righteous and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets and honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. My goodness, if that's not prophetic for today, I don't know what is. It, it gives you a little breather, doesn't it? Like, oh, no wonder I'm being attacked. No wonder there's people disagreeing with me. No wonder there's people, you know, and by the way, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities that are evil, right? And so when I see that people are caught up in this evil and this sin and they're coming at me against my truth, my, and not my truth, but the truth of God, I personally don't get offended by them especially outsiders who are not Christians, I'm not offended by them because I realize they have been duped by the devil and lies. But what I am concerned of is we in the church, we have to be careful ourselves. And so me personally, I evaluate my life, I evaluate other lives, and here's what we have to do. We have to pray for them that the blinders will be taken off from the devil, all the lies, and that they would see the truth Okay, but take comfort in God knows what you're going through because his truth has been questioned and attacked and outlawed anywhere sin and evil are celebrated. And so this resonated with me when I read it that, I, okay, no wonder, no wonder when, when I renounce evil or stand up for truth, I am attacked. And thirdly, truth on trial, uh, truth is suppressed by wickedness, and this is very similar to Isaiah 59, truth is suppressed by wickedness. The word suppressed here in the Greek means to hinder, to oppose, or not to accept. Um, to say that, that wickedness suppresses truth successfully would to say that God is not victorious over it, he is, but communities or people can be so caught up in wickedness that it hinders their ability to see truth. You follow me there? And so that's exactly the issue in Romans 1. And the context is amazing. I would encourage you to read Romans 1. But I want to give you just a couple of verses for the sake of time. And we'll get into this top, Romans 1 again in the future. But it says, Romans 1, verse 18 through 20. But God shows his anger from heaven or his wrath, his judgment against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Um, I just want to let you know that God is love but God is also holy. God is just. God is a judge. And God can't stand wickedness because it keeps you from being with him. He doesn't hate you. He hates the sin that you have accepted. He hates that you or me in times in our lives have suppressed the truth with wickedness. And so he's not afraid to confront you, to confront me when I read the scriptures and say, run from it, flee those evil desires. Our, our Hebrews 12, where he says to remove all the things that entangle you so you can run your race. Remove this sin that easily entangles you. It's because he loves you. So God is love so much that he'll hold you to holiness. He'll hold you accountable to the truth. 
So they, you have to take, you can't, here's what we do. And here's what we do in our world and we do this outside or in the church. We only take certain attributes of God that we like and leave the other ones out. But God will judge us for our life. And we have to understand that. And he's talking about a group of people who have completely rebelled and turned their backs on God. He's not talking about the church that serves him and loves him and purifies him. However, we become like the world if we don't remain in God, as Pastor Cornelius said last week. Now, verse 19, they know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can see, or they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Why do you think creation is questioned and attacked so much? Because it was obvious that God exists and then miracles and signs and wonders and these stories passed down from generations like the Red Sea being split, those things happened. We have no excuse except for to suppress it with our wickedness because we choose ourselves or other people rather than God. That's what our world's doing. And as we continue to walk in our wickedness or evil in our world, and sin, by the way, is very deceitful, okay, it deceives us in thinking that we're right, but we're wrong. When we do this, uh, well, we suppress what we should have already seen as reality, the beauty of God in creation, his existence. He really does exist. So the world argues that truth, let me tell you what the world says. The world argues that truth is relative or subjective. It changes to each individual that you can't have you can't have one absolute truth that defines what is true. That's what the world says. Uh, maybe you've heard this phrase, live your truth. Well, my truth is not your truth. Well, this worldview poses a few problems. Firstly, your truth eventually contradicts with the truths of a people around you. So in other words, your truth, if you want to make your own truth, will eventually contradict my truth. And so now, here's what happens next. Uh, it places insecurity in us about what is actually true and is essentially what is causing doubts or conflicts in people. So when I run into someone who believes something to be true and it's the opposite of mine and we talk, uh, it begins to make you wonder, well, maybe I'm not right. Secondly, your truth or their truth can eventually bring pain and suffering to one another. What do you mean, Ryan? Well, Hitler believed his truth was justified. The rest of the world deemed his truth false and acted accordingly. Therefore, we had a world war. So how did we do that, though? How did we determine to fight against Hitler, what did we use? We used absolute truth. What's that absolute truth? We made a judgment call based on the absolute truth that all people deserve to live no matter their ethnicity. That's what we made a decision on. Everyone deserves to live and not be killed the way they were being killed because of their ethnicity, the Jews. So that absolute truth helped us. So here's the value of having absolute truth. It's twofold. Absolute truth accurately defines what is moral, civil, and just. It accurately defines that. What is moral? What is civil? What is just? What is justice in our society? And secondly, absolute truth guides our actions accordingly. It tells us how to respond to things that are not moral, not just, not civil. Amen? That's what absolute truth does. And we believe God is absolute truth. We believe his word is absolute truth, Jesus is absolute truth, the spirit of God, all of it is truth. So let me, let me land the plane here. And again, this is just an introduction to the series and we'll get more into what is a biblical worldview and what is the Bible next week and I'll explain in a moment. But Paul, 
to his, his understudy, Timothy, wrote a very powerful letter. If, if, you, if you read First and Second Timothy, I actually like to read Second Timothy first before I read First Timothy. Um, but First Timothy, it, uh, the order is fine. It's exactly how it should be. Uh, but Second Timothy is Paul knows he's going to die. So he tells Timothy a bunch of important things before he dies. And you know what he focuses on? Faithfulness to the truth. Read it. Read 2 Timothy this week. And this is what he says in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Well, that's been happening for a long time, hasn't it? Paul tells Timothy and tells us, and I would tell you, to hold on to the truth. This is what he says in 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Church, I want to encourage you right now to know the truth, to know God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the word, know the truth and guard it. Don't just fall for everything you hear and see in our world. Check the motives of those preachers, those teachers, those people. They could be false prophets and false teachers. In Philippians 2.16, he says, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. You know, the Bible, we believe to be truth. It's the most read book in the world. It's also the most scrutinized. So why does the world try to dismiss the truth of the Bible? I want to answer this real quick before we go further in our series. I believe that what's going on is the Bible, and this is my personal conclusion from a lot of conversations I've had with people, There's probably more conclusions you can come up with, but I'm just gonna give you one. I think the reason why the world tries to dismiss the Bible and and scrutinizes it and tries to question its validity is because the Bible is a inconvenient truth. What do I mean by that? It exposes and confronts our sinful desires and challenges us to follow God's desires instead. But if the world would be open and humble enough to see why the truth confronts our sinful hearts, it would find out that the truth leads us to an eternal life that satisfies us. It's looking out for our good. God's looking out for our good. For his creation, he's looking out for us. Now you would be a really good critical thinker and apologetic if you asked and said this, okay, but you just made all these points, you said this whole sermon using the Bible. Isn't that circular reasoning? To use the Bible to prove the Bible. Isn't that circular reasoning? That's a really good question when it comes to defending the faith and debating with philosophers and other um, thought leaders and Stoics out there in the world. That is something that we talk about, circular reasoning. Well, I'm glad you asked that. If you didn't ask it, I asked it for you. In other words, the question I get asked all the time, especially from students in schools and, uh, and even college students to adults, how do you know the Bible is true then? If you're gonna preach an entire sermon, how can you do that if the Bible isn't true? Well, I'm, the Bible is true. And we can take reasoning and arguments from Scripture because of the scrutiny and the criticism it has survived through for ages. 
for centuries and centuries. So that's where we're headed next. Next week, we'll, we'll start answering what is the Bible? What is a biblical worldview? I'm going to give you guys some alarming statistics of where, uh, how the biblical worldview is fading in churches. But what I want to do is set up a framework of what is the Bible. And then I'm going to begin to show you the evidence of how the Bible is credible and valid and irrefutable. And this, this is evidence that historians, secular or Christian, have admitted that the Bible has been credible and therefore we can take truth from Scripture. Sound good? That's our little journey here. If we're going to say we have a biblical worldview, we need to be able to say the Bible is true, right? Uh, if we're going to say uh, we need to, let, let me just say what I wrote. We'll need to be able to prove the Bible is credible if we're going to build our lives upon it, around it, and share it with others. If the Bible is going to help determine how you live, we better prove it's true. I agree. So I'm going to bring you guys evidence in the coming month here to help you know it's true. I'll close with this. When Pilate asked, what is truth? He did not appear to care for or want the answer. I encourage you to ask questions, but be willing to earnestly seek and accept or consider at least the evidence presented. All right? Don't just ask a question and then walk away. Ask a question and go on a journey. Maybe it is true. Let's pray. Why don't we stand together too? I want to encourage you to come back today for our open house. If you'd like to meet our leaders and our, volu our amazing volunteers who serve here every week, uh, it's incredible. All the different ministries we have. We'll be here from 1230 to 230. We'll have some light refreshments as well for everyone. We're excited about getting to meet you and show the different ministries we have. They'll be all over the building and the other building as well. And uh, just thank you for your faithfulness to be here today. I appreciate that. Those online watching, thank you. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your serving. And thank you for inviting people. Would you please help us invite people for next week? Um, we need to help the world see the truth of God. And uh, so I would encourage you to do that. We're going to be careful to speak to your unsaved or unbelieving friends uh, through this series. And so... Um, Please bring them out. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for guiding us in truth. I thank you for this church that cares and wants the truth. And Lord, I pray that you would reassure us today. God, I pray you would help us as a, as a church, protect us, Lord, as we dive into these topics. We know that it will stir up the enemy's camp. We pray for protection around us and in in this house, this church, our lives. The devil's not going to like this. But God, we stand with truth because we want people to know the truth. We want people to know Jesus Christ and have what he offers, eternal life. So God, lead and guide us. Help us on this journey. We hold on to your truth because we love you and be with this church. Thank you for their faithfulness. In Jesus' name.